going to take up the Lord's Supper. It's, um, it's important for us to continue to remember God and to remember. The Bible says as often as you do this, uh, you do this in remembrance of me. And as we reflect back on uh, what God has done for us, it's very important that we always remember. There's a song that says, always remember Jesus, Jesus, always remember Jesus, Jesus, always keep him on your mind. You know, that, that's an old song, and um, it still rings true today. You should always remember Jesus, and the Bible says, um, as often as you do this, you're going to do it in remembrance of me. And that means you can do, you can literally do communion every day and not, and not um, be in the wrong. Um, you can literally do communion every day and not be in the wrong. And it's important for us, again, to remember Christ. I know we don't do it as often as we can, but uh, that's something that we want to we want to do um, even more so now uh, as we approach. As we approach the, the time of remembering Christ, and there's no there's no bad time. There's no bad time to have communion. No, it's a bad time. We should do it. There's no bad time to have communion. 
And uh, so as he talked with his disciples and as he sat with them at that last supper, what they did was um, he began to tell them, he began to explain. And I don't know if you ever watched that movie, The Bible. You ever see that movie, The Bible? It's a series, like a TV series. And I watched that, I was watching that the other day. And it was so, it brought it so real, real to me. Um, how Jesus began to take that bread and he broke it. And he began to explain to the disciples why it was important for you to eat of this bread. Why it's important for you to drink of this wine. And uh, we want to, we want to, we want to mimic that today. So if you had your, your, uh, your cup, let me pull up the scripture here. First Corinthians, the eleventh chapter, the twenty third through the twenty sixth verse. It says, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread. He took the bread. And I want to pause there because the bread represents his body. It's important for us to realize that it was just not in a coincidence that Jesus died for us, that he did what he did. It was not just an happenstance. It didn't just. Um, It didn't just happen, but it was with purpose and intention, and that intention was to set us free. So he took the bread, and I want you to open up your open up your caps. Now, before we take this bread, I want you to just kind of reflect back on your week. Back on your mind, back back on yesterday. And if there's anything in your heart, maybe you said something or did something that wasn't pleasing to God. The Bible says that we we want to we want to come to the Lord with a clean and pure heart. And so, if there's anything you may have said or done, just take take a few moments right now and just ask the Lord for forgiveness. God's forgiveness is instant. It's not something that you have to wait. It's not a delay, but it's immediate. Just reflect right now. If anything you did that may, may not have been pleasing to the, to the Lord, honestly, just ask for forgiveness right now. important because it talks about the blood of Jesus. And he passed the wine cup around. I don't, I don't have the wine cup passed around, so that's all we have in these individual juices. And um, as he passed that wine cup around, each person took some because they were saying, well, we want to we want to partake in your death. We want to partake in your um, in, in this. We want to be a part of what you're doing. And so, in order to be a part of what Jesus is doing, we want to partake in his body and his blood. But you have to understand the significance of his blood. It was not just blood. <laughs> it was not just blood. It was actually uh, meant for us 
to be healed, for us to be delivered, for us to be set free, for us to have um, what we consider a, 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 an opportunity that we never would have had had we not had the blood of Jesus. And all the pain and suffering and all the sorrows and all of the sicknesses and the diseases and all of that stuff was covered in the blood, covered by the blood of Jesus. And so as he took the cup, he said this, he said, in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Wait and open your juice. And go ahead and take your drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the Bible says they win. They went up into the hills singing hymns. We're not going to do that today, but they went up into the hill, hills singing hymns. And um, this is normally when we have our prayer time, so we are going to do that. We're going to allow the Lord to speak to us. Thank you, Lord. We're going to allow the Lord to speak to us and, and um, just listen for his voice. What better time than to have God speak to you than right after we've taken up the Lord's Supper? You know how you eat a meal, and then we didn't eat a meal, but you know how you sit down at supper, and then only afterwards you, you have a good fellowship and have a good conversation. You may get a cup of coffee, and you may be in a comfortable place, and this is how I want us to be today, where we're just sitting waiting for the Lord. We want the Lord to speak to us. Those that are watching online, you know, you could have got some crackers and some grape juice. I should have told you that. You could get communion right along with us. Um, but I want you to take some time right now to begin to just worship the Lord. We give you praise, God. We thank you. What a mighty God you are. Saw fit that we would be alive today. Could have been in a worse, worse condition, Lord. Some of, some of us were in car accidents. <laughs> that could have been detrimental to our lives. Would you spare us, God? Some of us even encountered sickness that has taken others out, but God, we're alive. And we give you praise for it. Some of us have encountered other things, other dangers that we knew not of, but you had protected us. Your hand of protection was upon us. And for this, we give you praise. Thank you for each and every family that's represented here today and those that are watching online. I pray, God, that you would touch each person right now, wherever they are. In the name of Jesus, that you would give them strength, that you would give them courage, that you would make yourself known to them. In the name of Jesus, give them a visitation. Let them know that you're loved. And help us always to remember the great and awesome sacrifice that happened years ago so that we could be free. So we can approach the throne of God boldly, without reservation, knowing that he doesn't see us, but he sees Christ. And it's the blood of Jesus that covers us. So we give praise right now. We ask the Lord that you would continue to strengthen us, and continue to guide us and lead us into the direction that you want us to go in the name of Jesus. 
May he praise right now. We pray for our leaders, our president and our congressmen and our mayors and councilmen and police officers and firemen, teachers, Lord. We pray for the schools. As the kids get ready to go back into the schools, I pray that there would be a safe haven for them to learn without fear. We pray against any acts of violence that may try to arise. We ask that you protect our teachers and, and the principals and all of the councils and all the coaches and all of the people that are dealing with athletics. Protect them and watch over them. In the name of Jesus, let this be a year, a year to remember, not in a bad way, but God in a godly way. And we just give you praise. We thank you for the ability to do what we do. We ask that you would continue to do what you said you would do in our lives and help us to reflect you in our daily walk. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise, glory, and honor. Now just take a few moments right now where you are and begin to worship the Lord. Begin to give him praise. Begin to let him know how grateful you are for what he's done for you. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. I'm going to put a timer on as I do every week and uh, timer on as I do every weekend. Three minutes and I want you to just listen for the voice of the Lord. Those that are watching online, just pause what you're doing. Whatever you're doing, just, just pause and listen for the voice of the Lord.
anyone heard anything from the Lord that they would like to share, I want to give you a moment to do that. Hallelujah. I say all the time, there's no pressure. And I heard three words on this evening. I heard four words. Four words. And I guess we feel this in because the Lord said, the time is now. That's what I heard. I just heard it just as, just as clear as I'm talking to you. The time is now. What, what is that time? What is that Fill in, I don't know all the pieces, but I just heard the time is now. So just take that for whatever it is, whatever it means to you. Uh, maybe that's a significant thing. Maybe there's something that you've been waiting for to do, and God is saying the time is now. Maybe it's something that you've been trying to break out of, and the Lord is saying the time is now. But just take that and, and, and run with it. Amen. The time is now. And um, if we are sensitive, this is the key, you have to have sensitive, sensitivity to the Spirit of the Lord. You have to have sensitivity to the Spirit of the Lord. And when you do that, God will really begin to reveal Himself to you in ways that you never thought possible. But it takes, it takes being very sensitive. You know, that means that when God flinches, you go. And you know, because you know his hand, you know his voice, you know his mood. So in order to do that, of course, it requires us to walk real close to God. The closer we walk to God, the higher our sensitive sensitivity level is. Amen? Amen. Uh, I'm going to just share with you a few things and announcements um, that God is doing. Uh, before we do that, I just kind of want to want you all to just greet each other. Just tell your neighbor, hello, glad to see you. Show them them pearly whites. Show them them smile, amen, and let them know that you're glad to see them, amen. Just take a few minutes right now and do that. It's so good to see each and every one of you, and I'm glad that you did come today. I pray that God will bless you in ways that you never thought, never, never thought, hardly could, couldn't imagine it. I pray that God will bless you in that way. Amen. Um, as you all know about our, our ministry in Kenya, we are uh, in the process of harvesting our crops. It already started this week. They started harvesting the crop. And so um, I'll have pictures of that uh, with them laying out the corn and everything. I'll have some pictures of that for you for, on next week uh, of the harvest. Um, because that, that's what you see is now being, they, they're harvesting it. So that's an awesome thing that we've reached this point and now we're going to be Within the next few months, we'll plant some more seeds for a new crop for next year. And um, of course, our water well is still servicing folks. Our kids in college, two young people, they finished their their first year of college, and um, they they did well. I'm gonna get your get their reports and, and show you how they did in college, grade wise. We want to we want to get to see all of that, and uh, it's because of your giving and your generosity, we've been able to do that. Um, We've got a lot going on in Nigeria. Uh, we're in the process of, of, of repairing the building. We have the building. We've secured it for the next four years. We've paid for that, uh, for that building for the next four years. Now the next phase is to repair it. We're in the process of we're going to get a roof put on it. We're going to get a floor put in. We're going to get toilet, toilets, everything put in there, some windows fixed, and it'll be up and running. And so we're in our next phase of Collecting, we're going, to need, we're going to need about another four thousand uh, dollars, four between four and six thousand to complete that. It's not a lot when you're talking about a building structure, and you're talking about the next four years. And
And so uh, we're in the process of collecting for that and raising funds. And so we can get these kids back in school because right now they're not in school. The building is not ready to inhabit them yet. Uh, but once we get that ready, we'll, we'll get these kids to get them back in school. Um, that's the building there. We've already cleared all of the all of the uh, weeds and bushes have already been cleared from the land. I'll have pictures of that for you on next week as well. Uh, and then we're going to show you on the inside of the floors and different things like that as we as we get that ready. Uh, so God is doing some awesome stuff, and um, and I'm so glad that we are a part of what He's doing worldwide. And we have our hand in it, not just that, but we are directing and, and calling shots as far as what they need to do and how they need to do it. We're getting advice, but we're calling and letting them know what they need to do and when they need to do it. And uh, so we need your support and prayers. Uh, we are still uh, continuing to. Uh, provide meals through Lucille's 1913, which is a local organization. Um, we have not yet uh, committed to kids' meals. But that's something that's coming this fall. We're going to commit to an amount that we're going we're to sow into this ministry to help get uh, kids fed locally. Um, so that's something that we're going to do. On next Saturday, I want the brothers to get fired up. We're going to be having our meetup. I call it our men's meetup. Get to know you with Pastor E on Saturday, August 20th uh, at 9.30. We'll be meeting at Chick-fil-A. I'm going to change, change the venue. <laughs> we'll meet at Chick-fil-A a, a little, bit, little bit further down the road here on Highway 6. Uh, for those that are watching, if you're local and you want to come out and join us, it's uh, Chick-fil-A on Highway 6, uh, 6175 uh, South Highway 6 North in Houston, Texas. Man, come on out. We're going to have a good time. We just, just iron sharpens iron and really sew into one another uh, in that uh, in that men's breakfast or that men's meetup. And uh, we're always excited about pouring into and, and, and experiencing the fellowship with the brothers. And uh, it's always good. The Bible says, oh, how good it is. And pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. And uh, we're excited about that. Um, there's a couple of ways to give. I want you to prepare your hearts to give today if you haven't um, done so already uh, you can give by going to our website overflowchurch.tv uh, for those that are watching online overflowchurch.tv click on the give link and you can give that way you can also text the word flow f-l-o-w to the number 206-859-9405 or you can cash app us at dollar sign overflow church um, on yesterday uh, we were at a marketplace and I had a gentleman that came to the table and um, we just kind of connected. He had an Alaska hat on his head and started talking. And I began to share with him what we were doing in the ministry. And as I began to share with him, when he left, he, he actually sowed a seed. He said, put this in the church. And it was not one dollar, it wasn't two dollars, it wasn't three. It was, you know, it was it was a, it was a seed. And, uh, and uh, I just wanted to let you know that people are seeing what was happening. When you tell people, if, you, if you're not talking about what's going on at Overflow, I encourage you to do that. Do that in your circles of influence. Let them know what's going on. Somebody may want to donate and help us out. Because we can use the help, amen? We can use the help. Um, it's going to get done. God is going to make it happen. But uh, the more people we have involved, the less the burden is on, on others. Amen. So we do have uh, a fourth way to give. Through, you can give through Zelle. Um, and that's uh, our, our um, website or our uh, email is wecanoverflow at gmail.com. Wecanoverflow at gmail.com. That's our email for Zelle if you want to give through that way as well. Uh, so we thank you for what you've done. Thank you for how you've sown into the ministry. I want to pray over your gift. Lord, I pray that you bless each and every person that's given whether online or in person, I pray that you would give them increase, cause their, their bank accounts to, 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 to grow, cause their, their economic situation to change in Jesus' name. We thank you right now. We give you praise. Thank God. Amen. Amen. So we are in our series, I'm Dead, Now What? I'm Dead, Now What? And part two is... This is a very um, difficult message 
to uh, to preach. And um, just because of the topic alone, you don't hear a lot of people preaching about uh, what happens after you die. There's not a lot of a lot of pastors that preach about that, and I'm not bragging, I'm not boasting, I'm simply saying this is something that's needed in the body of Christ, something that's needed in the body of Christ. We need individuals who are willing to, uh, to take the risk, <laughs> take the risk of being a little uncomfortable so that we can help those that are around us, those that are around us. For the men, I forgot to announce this, there are some cards in the back. I want you to take one or two of those and you can invite uh, someone out to our men's meeting as well. Um, so with this type of message, it's, it, it's very uh, difficult at times to, uh, to get across. And a lot of times we want to shy away from topics uh, like this just because of the nature of it. Because it's very real. Um, and even when you talk about uh, 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 topics like this, sometimes you um, you feel like, man, people feel like I'm pointing my finger at you, or you, you targeted me, and that's not that's not the case at all. And it's not it's not the intent to make someone feel uncomfortable in the sense that I'm telling you this, but to make you feel uncomfortable in the sense that yes, if you're if you're comfortable and complacent with your life. And it's causing you to, 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 to live a life not fully expounding on the potential that God has put in you, then yes, I want to make you uncomfortable if that's the case. But but um, as we look at this, because it's such a challenge, challenging message, it's very important that people know that hell is real. Some people don't believe it. And I want to share, you, share some statistics with you as I talk about this. But some people don't believe that hell is real. And um, one of the things that we are responsible for as leaders, or responsible for as children of God, is to make people aware. Yes, make people aware of the love of Jesus Christ, but make people also aware that there is coming a time when we will all stand before the Lord. We'll all have to give an account to every action that we have in this body. And, and, and people will always say, you know, God is so good, he's gracious, he's a just God, he would never do that to me, he would never cause me to go there. But I'm going to show you in scripture how, because he's a just God, because he can't lie, because he cannot go against his word, he will allow that to happen. And, uh, but we, we don't want to be on that side of the, of the fence, we want to be on the other side of the fence. You know, we serve a righteous and holy God. And, and, and he has designed, he has put in place measures for us to be free and not have to face the fires of hell. God has put that in place. And, and, and so if you don't accept the reality that it exists, you will just live your life any, any kind of way. And that's not what we want to do. That's not how we want to do. Because what we believe about eternity determines how we live each and every day. What we believe about eternity determines how we live each and every day. I was going to play a clip, uh, but I couldn't find one that was short enough, really, to, to kind of compact into what I was what I was trying to show. But there's some names that you can look up. You can maybe look up, look them up on YouTube and watch some of their videos. Uh, but there's some names and some books that would be very interesting to you. And these are these are written by what, who I consider authorities. Um, that have experienced these things. Um, Mary K. Baxter, she wrote a book called The Divine Revelation of Hell, where God actually allowed her to experience hell and brought her back. And her book is, is very, very graphic. It's very extensive as far as what she talks about. Bill Weiss also, the Lord allowed him to experience 23 minutes in hell. True story. And he preaches all over the country talking about his experience. And he gives very details about what happened there and what's going on there. So these are things that are going to give you a kind of a, 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 a bird's eye look into what is happening in an underworld that we don't have any idea of. Uh, Brian Melvin, this, this gentleman was an atheist. He actually grew up in a Christian home, but when he got old enough, 
he said he tried to he tried to disprove God. He said, "There's this God stuff. Why is all this good stuff happening in the bad people? Why is it, if God is in charge, why is this happening? Why are planes falling out of the air? Why are we having earthquakes?" He started questioning God, and he began to walk away from God. And he died. He died and went to hell. And when he was there, he said, when he first he approached the light, he said he, it was like a bright light. He said it was in peace. It was the most peaceful thing he ever experienced. Was approaching this light. And then all of a sudden, he said he, it was Jesus. He said he had a robe over his face. Couldn't see his face. But the light was just beaming out of him. He saw the nail scars in his hand. He saw the different things happening. Uh, that had happened to Christ and God, God revealed himself to him in that manner but then he after that period he said he felt the judgment of God and he began to go down this big old tube and he talks about it but you gotta you gotta you got look up his story and, and listen to it and he said before he went Jesus said you can use my name this is true he said you can use my name when you get there and uh and he was using it, the name of Jesus at that point when he wouldn't know agnostic or atheist at that point anymore. <laughs> because he felt the fire. He felt the heat. He felt the pain. He felt the, the separation. He felt the loneliness. He felt all of these things. And so he began to say the name of Jesus. Every time he was Jesus, 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 name of Jesus, 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 Jesus. He just began to say Jesus. And he said the pain wasn't as bad. The Lord allowed him to, to have, uh, have some relief, but God allowed him to come back. And he talks about how he, he came out of his body and he came back. And he saw everything. When he went up, he saw the roof of the building. He saw all this stuff. And then when he came back, when he actually came back to life, he went on the roof to verify if he saw what he saw was real. And it was. The stuff that he saw when he was out of his body, he saw for real. So um, these are just individuals. Randy K. he talks about heaven. John Ramirez was a, was a satanic priest. He was a satanic priest that was saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then Rebecca Brown also was, was heavily involved in the occult. Occult, devil worship, witch, witchcraft. She was heavily involved in that. God set her free. And so those are books. Uh, a Land Unknown is, is written by um, Brian Melvin. And uh, Rebecca Brown wrote uh, a book called He Came to Set the Captives Free. And um, so... Those are just some materials that I think you would be interested in and, and educate, educating you about that world that we know very little about other than what the word of God says. So again, what you believe about eternity determines how you live today. Let's go to the word of God in Matthew. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, 13 and 14th verse. Um, and before I read that, one of the, some of the statistics that I want to share with you is 74% of Americans believe in heaven. 74% of people that you see, that means that 7 out of 10, about 7 out of 10 people that you see believe in heaven. But only 1 in 4, I mean, only 4 in 10 believe uh, that they would, that the people that who reject Christ are going to spend eternity in hell. So only four out of ten people believe that. That's a, that's a you know it's like not even fifty percent. Talking about forty percent of the people believe that if you don't accept Christ, you're going to spend eternity in hell. And and um, and only one percent, only half to one and a half one. Um, excuse me, only half to one percent of the people believe that they personally are going to hell because of their lifestyle. Now, think, think about that statistic. It, only half a percent, half to one percent of everybody that we see believes that because of their lifestyle, they're going to hell. That's, that's a small, small percentage. But the reality is, as it says in scriptures right here, Matthew 7, 13, 14, it says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many, many enter through it. There's, there's a lot of people that are on that road. There's a lot of people. But then verse 14 says, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. So 
I mean, when you look around, you know, even if you look at churches and, and you kind of get a statistic, you can't base it on what's on people that are here. But if you look around and see how many people are really pushing in and trying to do what God is talking to do and really trying to be that man or woman of God, like, like I mean, with passion, it says there's few. It's few. And um, it's, it's not a, a comforting statistic, but it is a fact that a lot of people just want to do just enough. Just let me just do just enough. I want to just get by. I want to just get by. And, the, and, 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 and this is one thing. If I was a devil, I'm not. But if I were, all I got to convince you is that there is no hell. All I got to do is tell you and, and make you believe there's no hell. If I can get you to believe that, guess what? You're not going to take life seriously. You're not going to take serving Christ seriously. You're not going to take being a child of God seriously and living a righteous and holy life on a daily basis. You're not going to take that seriously because... There's no hell anyway, so you know there's a theory that, that's that's going around. On, you know when you die, and there's a lot of people that believe this. Uh, you're going to be reincarnated, or you're going to be you're going to come back as something else. You, you you're a human now, but then when you come back next time, depending on how well you live, you might be a tree, <laughs> or, you, or you might be a pet, or you might be this. All of that stuff is just myth. It's not true. There's not a not one one ounce of truth to that at all. When you die, guess what? The life that you that that you that follows you is going to be based on the life you live now. It's going to be based on how you give your life to Christ now. And that's what's important is that we understand that this walk coming to church and and and, and reading our word and praying every day and being kind to people, all of that stuff is playing a playing a role in our eternity. If I could, if God, if God, if God were to roll open up a scroll, which I've, I've, some of the stories that I've read and heard about, God began to reveal to people what their life was, and every deed they would, they would, be, they would, they would reveal that those deeds, and they, some of them felt like they were just like, oh my God, I crucified Christ again because of what I did. That's how, that's how guilty they felt, the, the weight of guilt that they felt when they were in the presence of God, that they had nowhere to hide. That they were completely transparent. And when you think about it, in, in, in Genesis, when, when God said to Adam and Eve, he said, if you eat off of this tree, surely you're going to die. You're going to eat off of this tree of good and evil, you're going to die. And that, that surely you're going to die, it was actually die twice. That's what it meant. It, it was die, die. You're going to die twice. But because of what Jesus did, we, we, we die once. We have the possibility of dying once and living forever when we accept him in our life. That's the beautiful part of it. That's what I love about this is that we live in the dispensation of grace that we don't have to feel like, oh my God, I'm not going to make it. I, I can't do this. Yes, you can. And you can make it. And God will make it possible. All you have to do is raise your hand and say yes to him. That's all you got to do. So they want to they, they want to reject the fact that there's a there's a there's a, there's a real hell. They want to reject the fact that that there's going to be suffering in this body and in, 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 in this time when they pass when they leave this world and go to the next. They want to reject the fact that that, that it's going to, it can be really bad. And so because of that rejection, they don't have a fear of God. I don't know about you, but I I, I was crying last night. I was crying like a baby. I, I was crying. I was crying. Ooh, I was crying this morning because I was thinking about the grace of God and I was thinking about how awesome the opportunity we have and that even in this life, even some of the thoughts that I may have had or some of the things that I've done in the past that I go back and I regret and I look back, man, why did I do that? And I feel the guilt, but I know that I've been set free. I know that Jesus has already cleansed me and washed me, but I, I felt that and I felt that for the people. Even when I was preparing the message, I felt like, man, if somebody could just grab this and just run with it, just know that God is there for them, that they don't have to live their life and, and end up in that dreadful place. Dreadful place. Um, and so we have to be careful to live our life for God, for Christ. Not reject his sacrifice, not, not avoid persecution because of comfort reasons. Not avoid, you know, being, being one that, that, that's pointed out because you're a Christian, because you serve God. Don't, don't, don't shy away from that. Don't shy away from the, the fact that because you serve God, you're not going to drink alcohol. 
you're you're not gonna smoke marijuana or you're not gonna go fornicate. Don't don't reject, don't don't shy away from that. That's something that you may experience persecution from your peer. You may experience people talking about you saying you, you think you're all of that. But guess what? It doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter even what they say. What matters is that your soul is right. That's what matters. Because when it's all said and done, when pastor's not even standing up here talking to you and, and sharing Christ with you and sharing the word of God with you, guess what? When you when you have to stand before the Lord, he's not going to say, did, did you live the way the pastor told you? No, he's not going to say that. He's going to say, did you live the way I told you? Because I'm just simply a messenger. That's all. I'm just, he pours it to me, I pour out. That's all. That's all I do. I don't, I don't have any special powers or special any of that. I'm just a messenger. And I've, I've chose to be used by the Lord. So don't avoid that. Don't, don't fall in love with the world. Don't fall in love with the things that are, that are comfortable, the ways that the world sees as good. Don't fall in love with those things. But begin to share Christ. Now, there's a few things that I want to share with you. Why does hell exist? Why does hell exist? Come on, what? That's a good question. Why did hell exist? Why did hell come about? Exactly. It really wasn't meant for any of the humans that lived. The hell was never meant for humans. It was meant for God to deal righteously with Satan. Because Satan rose up. If you read in the word, he says, I will be as God. He rose up and he, he caused a third of the angels to rebel against God. And a third, him and a third of the angels were cast down. Where were they cast down? They were cast down to the earth. And I believe something happened between Genesis 1 and the first chapter and Genesis 1 and the second chapter. That's a whole other message and topic. <laughs> because it said God created the earth and then it said the earth was without form and void. So God doesn't create anything without form and void. Something happened there in between those two verses. But anyway, those, those, de those angels then became demons. They were cast down. They were they were no longer under the authority of God. They were no longer under the protection of God. And they became demons. And that's why hell exists. It was to, it was to take care of them first. So Satan, um, he's not a harmless dude in a red suit with a pitchfork. That's not, that's not who he is. <laughs> don't have horns. Well, he may have horns. I don't know. He's evil. But he is the embodiment of evil. He's behind every addiction, every abuse, every fear, every pain, every shame. He is the destroyer. He comes to destroy. He doesn't want you to have no joy. He doesn't want you to have no peace. He doesn't want you to have no kind of comfort at all. That's what he does. He doesn't want you to have any of that. The Bible calls him a deceiver. It calls him the dragon. It calls him the dark angel. It calls him the serpent. It calls him the adversary. These are all names of Satan in the Bible. It calls him the enemy. It calls him the tempter, the wicked one, the thief, the father of lies, the prince of darkness, the angel of abyss. He comes to steal your joy, kill your faith, destroy your health, ruin your finances, obliterate your marriages and relationships, take your kids. That's what he wants to do. And the scripture says this, Revelations 20 and 10, it says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophets had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's why hell was created. That's why. And so you don't want to be deceived by the enemy because he will try to take you out through deception. Number two, hell exists for God to deal righteously with unbelievers. To deal righteously with unbelievers. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9, it says, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. That's why people say, you know, 
You can't send good people to hell. It says injustice to do that. Someone has to pay. The same people that argue for God's love and mercy and grace, they don't express the same justice. But we have to understand that as a believer, we have the right to go to heaven because we have accepted Christ and we live our life for him. It puts us in a different category. But if you, if you fail to follow God's word, if you fail to live your life for Christ, there are consequences. It's just like if you have children, when, when a child does something that they shouldn't do, you punish them different ways. Some people say, you're going to sit in the corner. You're going you're gonna to stay in that corner for three minutes. Put your nose over there. Some people take the belt and spank them. Some people do other things. I'm taking away all your toys. You're not having no toys for a week. But there are different, there are different ways to punish a child and make them think twice before they do something wrong again. Well, our time is coming when we don't follow the word of God. We don't do what God tells us to do. We don't, we don't, um, we're not pursuing God the way he wants us to. And then all of a sudden, time runs out for us. And we're standing before the Lord. If you could, if you could imagine yourself standing before the Lord, what would you say to him when he says, I, I see you now. You're in front of me. What have you done? What are you going to say to God when you're standing before? That's a, that's a scary that's a scary situation to be thinking about, especially if you're not really doing what God told you. That's, that's kind of scary because it's like every one of us is going to stand before the Lord. Every one of us. There's not one of us that's going to be like, well, I'm going this way. I'm going to skirt around that way. I'm not going. No. <laughs> we are all going to stand before the Lord and give an account to our actions in our life. Um, so we can't we can't take the liberty to remake God into what we want him to be so that we can live comfortable. Some people will take the word of God and they'll they'll they'll, they'll take a piece of it, you know, and then they'll, they'll okay, we just, we're not gonna tell the rest of it, we're gonna just take that piece. And we're gonna take that piece. Okay, we, that, that part we can't, we can't talk about that. You know. But we can't do that. We have to take the whole part, the whole loaf. You know, uh, the Bible says that God winked at their ignorance. That means that, you know, if you do something that you, you didn't know you did wrong, okay, there's a wink. But then if you do something that you know is wrong, that wink ain't there no more. It's not a, it's not a wink, okay, I understand. No, you know. You know it's wrong. And that's why we, again, we trusted God with all our heart. Because there's nothing impossible to, for God. We can live a holy life. But it's impossible for God to be holy without being just. That's what's impossible. That's what's impossible. Um, Luke, the 16th chapter, 19 through the 21st verse says this. It says, there was a rich man. This is a story that, that will resonate with you. And all of these kind of parallel, these, these stories that I've been watching and reading. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen. In other words, he had it going on. He was... He had the best of everything. Lived in luxury every day, man. His life was just lush. And at the gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat, but fell from the rich man's table. He wanted to eat, just have, just give me some crumbs. You don't have to, because even the crumbs off the rich man's table is probably like, wow, that, that was a tasty morsel. You know, they had those chefs that could cook special food and, 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 and the crumbs probably were like, oh, wow, this is very tasteful. And this beggar laid in his gate and asked for crumbs. But this man, he didn't accept the reality of hell. He never appreciated the glory of the word of God, the glory of the gospel. And, and so um, as this man laid at his gate begging, this, this wealthy guy, he, he washed his, his hands and, and he would throw some crumbs here and there. But he wasn't doing anything wrong, per se, but he just wasn't doing anything. He was just living his life and just lavishly, lavishly. Yeah, verse 22 says this, the time came when the beggar died and the angels 
carried him to Abraham's side. This is the Abraham, the bosom of Abraham, they talk, they, they call that. Carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. One was carried, one was buried. Catch that. Lazarus was carried because he was a child of God. God is always going to carry you. He's always going to take care of you. So he was carried to, the, to Abraham's side. The rich man died, but he was buried. So people that don't live for Christ, guess what? They're going to be buried. They're not going to be carried. They're going to be buried. And, and it says in Hades, where he was in torment. Hades is uh, from, the Greek, uh, from the Greek word Gehenna. Where he was in torment. He looked and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. He's out, you, you know, we, in the summer when it's hot here in Houston, what do we do? We get some ice cold water and we chug that water like it is going out of style. It's like, and, it, and it's still, you know, it, it kind of gets you to there, gets you where you want. But he said, I just want a, a, a tip, just tip, put the tip of your finger in the water and just let it drip on my tongue. Because I am in agony in this fire. He's being burned, but he's not being burned. He feels the heat, but there's, there's, no, there's no distinguishing of him. And then a lot of the stories that I read, there's a young man named Josh, uh, I should have got his name, 25 year old, Lord allowed him to experience that. He said he went down and it was just cold, smoldering. He said it was hot, it was stinky, just the stench was just unbearable. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the pain, another person described the pain that there's, our bodies are made of water. How much percentage of our body is water? A lot, very high percentage of our body is water. But there, there is no life. There's no life in the blood. The water is gone. So you imagine your bones and everything just without water. What, what kind of pain would you be in? And that pain is everlasting. It's continual. So he says, I'm in agony in this fire. And, and, um, and, and, it, and then he says, they too, uh, if, you, if you read on the, read on into that scripture, that I miss it. About his agony in the fire, and he just wanted—he just wanted a drop of water. Just wanted just a drop of water. That's all. And and if we can imagine that this place is real, it's not just a made-up fairy tale. It's not just something people just oh, there's a hell, you know, yeah. And it's not—it's not a—it's real. It's a real place that people, real people, go when they don't serve God. And we don't want to find ourselves on that side. Of the coin. We don't want to find ourselves under. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Without Christ, the absent from the body is the beginning of suffering. Because as soon as you leave this place and you haven't yielded yourself to God, it's the beginning of suffering. It's not going to be no, okay, well, we, we're going to pause for a minute. You're going to just get a little rest. No, it's an immediate something that's happening when you die. You're going one place or another. You're not going to just be hanging out. <laughs> you know, you, you see the movies and cartoons where they show the spirits just kind of floating around and they don't have nowhere to go. They're just floating out here. That's not the case. Because you're absent from this body, but you're present with the Lord. And at that point, what will you answer to God? What will you answer to God? This place is unspeakable. There's unspeakable torment. Torment. It's like a fiery furnace. It's, it's sulfur. The Bible says there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Somebody described that he was there and he was standing and he said it was like, it was like he was in mud and it was moving. But it was moving and what was in the mud was little worms. And the worms had teeth on them and they were biting him. Just constantly biting him. You, could, there was, you couldn't get rid of it. I don't know if you've ever been into a place where you been around like something that was like bees or insects or something and just that's a tormenting feeling ants you ever walk in an ant pile and the ants get on you and they bite you well they, we're talking about worms fiery worms with teeth biting this is what was happening this gentleman had experienced hell 
So it's a real, very real thing. Revelations 14, 10, and 11, and I'm almost finished. It said, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with a burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. That's some scary stuff. Again, the Greek word translated as hell is, is Hades or Gehenna. It comes from the valley of Hinmon, which means a place of everlasting punishment. A place of everlasting punishment. Jesus used that word several times, and it referred to a garbage dump, which was south of Jerusalem, which was a place to burn things. They would not burn things in the center of the city. They would take it out of the city, and then they would, they would burn it. It was waste, and there was, there was there was sewage, and there was flesh, and they and they burned it, and that's what happens. So think about it. Think about it. That's not some place that you want to be, naturally or spiritually. That's not some place that you want to go. I, I would hope that people would catch the fact that you have time. Time time is on time right now is on your side because you're breathing, you're living. But the day you stop breathing in this sphere, I hope you're ready. That's what I pray. I pray. My prayer for you is that you're ready to see God. And it can happen at any moment. The Bible says, no man knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man shall appear. No one knows when their life is. I always tell you this. I tell everybody this all the time. We know what our birthday is. But there's not one of us in here that knows when we're going to die. We can't predict it. We can't say, oh, I got another 10 years. I'm healthy. Look at me. I eat good. I exercise. I can. You can't predict when you're going to die. <laughs> None of that matters. And I'm not saying don't do that. I think it's good to be healthy and to exercise and eat good. I think that's great. But don't rely on that to dictate that you've got a lot of time left. Because you could have a lot more time than I could, or I could have a lot more time than you could. Only God. But the bottom line is we need to be living for Christ on a day-by-day -day basis. The Bible says that the, the fire continually burned. There were dead animals. There were bodies. There were, there were criminals. There, were, there was human waste. There was all kinds of stuff. All this, you, the worst things that you could imagine were there. The worst smell that you could ever smell is there. Like it's like, I don't even want to talk about that. But the worm dieth not. Burning flesh and, 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 and just, oh, just bad. And it's nonstop. It's the, there's, no, there's, no, there's no rest. I hear a lot, of, a lot of similarities with the folks that have experienced that. They say they can't breathe. They say they're like, they're gasping for breath. Like they literally are having the hardest time breathing, but they're still alive. Have you ever been short of breath? <laughs> And, and you're just like, man, I can't, I'm trying to catch my breath, you know? And eventually you catch it and you oh, I feel better now. Well, there's no catching of breath there. It, it just, it's just a constant, you're, you, know, you, you know, there's not enough oxygen. But you still smell everything. You still feel everything. You still feel every bite, every touch, every, you know. I, I know that when I work out sometimes, um, at the day, the next day, I'm, I'm in pain. My, my muscles are aching. My, my back is aching chest, different parts of my body are aching. Well, imagine that magnified by 10 to 20 times. And it's always like that. It never goes away. Imagine that. There's no, there's no laughter. There's no light. There's no peace. There's no friendship. People say, oh, we're going to have a party. You know, we're going to party down there. We're going to get it down. We, you know, I might as well go. We might as well be partying when we get down there. Yeah. You think you're going to be partying. But guess what? You're going to see everybody. They're going to see you. But you can't even communicate with them. You're gonna be this, it's the loneliest place. You'll be around all these people, but completely lonely. Completely separated from God. There's no love there, there's no peace there. And something's always waiting to attack you. <laughs> kind of sounds familiar here. Some people want to attack you, you know, they want to get on you through the through social media. They want to attack you through you look a certain way, they want to attack you. But there it's gonna be magnified. And those attacks are going to be real. 
Luke 16, 27 says, he answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. Because he was in a bad place. He was like, man, if I can't get saved, send my send, send people to my brothers. He said, I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. So this is what the point of really why we're here is God is giving us an opportunity to warn other people. Not only warn them, but just share the love of Christ. I'm not trying to scare folks. We're not trying to scare people into getting saved. We just want you to be aware of the reality of hell. It is real. And we want to warn as many people as we can. Throw that life raft out there. Because when it when, when it's too late, as, the, as this rich king, all this money couldn't, couldn't pay anything. Couldn't, couldn't buy him a drop of water. All that money, the, the purple linen and all that luxury life, couldn't buy him a, a drop of water. And he begged him. He said, I beg you, send Lazarus to my family. Five, five brothers, let him warn them so that they will not come. He was, he was thinking about his brother. See, the, the consciousness of someone, you're very conscious. He was very conscious of, of his family. He said, I don't want them to come here. This is the worst, this is the worst thing that they can that could happen to them. Think about your family members that don't know God. Think about folks that may be just kind of like, ah, this Jesus stuff, all that. Think about them and think about the, the, the possibility of them ending up there. That's a sobering thought. That makes you kind of want to start praying for them, right? <laughs> Makes you kind of want to share something. Hey, man, you, you, you sure you don't want to give your life to Christ? You might want to do that. You know, you might want to do that. There's four lessons. and I'm not going to go through all this, but four lessons that we learned from the other side. The rich man was fully conscious and aware. Any pain, memories, regrets, he felt all of that. The rich man's eternal destiny was irrevocable. Once you get there, there's no getting out. Now, there are stories of folks that have had the opportunity. They went and God allowed them to come back. But there's not the masses. So it's a fixed thing. The rich man knew that his suffering was just. In other words, he knew that what he was dealing with and what he was feeling was just. And the rich man begged and pleaded for someone to help his brothers to know Jesus. He begged and pleaded with them. Because he had complained about the pain, but there was nothing he could do about it. There's no pain relief. There's no Motrin. <laughs> there's, there's not going to be any, any Ben Gay for your muscles. There's not going to be any headache pain for your headaches. If you ever had a migraine, just, have, just imagine having a migraine headache forever. Just, it doesn't go away. <laughs> that's, that's a tormenting thought in itself. So just remember how you, how you conduct yourself. This is a powerful scripture. This is what brings the power to the scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 6.23 says, sin is death. So anything that you're doing in your body that's causing you to sin against God, those wages are death. But the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. And then this verse says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made and we have been made right with, in God's sight by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. These are comforting scriptures, something that you should always. Hold dear to you and close. Because the enemy's coming to steal, kill, and destroy. But God has come, Jesus Christ has come, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. That we don't have to live a life of fear. But we know that God loves us. He's a just God. And Jesus' death on the cross, he paid the price for our sins. He, he, he has satisfied God's justice through his suffering. And, through, and it allows us to live in that grace and that unquenchable love. And Jesus said, if there's a hundred sheep, if there's one missing, guess what? I'm going after the one. So today I'm going, I'm, I'm letting you know that Jesus is coming after you. He's letting you know that you don't have to deal with it. You don't have to end up in that in that terrible place. That's 
why we want people to know him. We want him to know his goodness. We want him to know his grace, his love, his mercy, his kindness. It exceeds, it supersedes everything else. And so those questions that are on the screen are questions for, for you to reflect. The questions that that you should you should have answers to. Questions that you should be be, be answering, that answering that answering those questions. What is it? Are you living each day like eternity matters? And if you die today, are you ready to meet God? Those are two questions that you could ask anybody out on the street. If some of them look at you strange, like, what are you talking about? Am I ready to meet God? And you just ask them, are you ready to meet God? And you'll be surprised at some of the answers you get. Some people, oh yeah, I'm going, I'm going to see the man upstairs because I've been doing good today. I done done my good deeds, you know, and I gave that guy on the corner a dollar. <laughs> I done smiled and waved at three people. I'm good. But it goes beyond that. It goes to a life that is committed and sacrificed, uh, that, we, that, we, that we've given our life to Christ and that we have not compromised. We've not compromised but we've given our life to Christ. Amen, we're standing. I'm finished. If you reflect on these questions, maybe, maybe, just maybe, just maybe it's, it's, it's life that you've been thinking about. Maybe it's, 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 it's something that, that has happened to you that has caused you to feel like just not walking the way I should. I'm not doing the way I should. I, 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 I don't know if, if something were to happen to me today, would I be ready to see God? And if you have if you have a question mark in your mind when you ask yourself that question, I want to let you know that today is the day that you don't have to have that question mark anymore. You can know for a fact that you are going to be with the Lord when you die. I talk to people all the time and I ask them the question, if you die today, I've asked that question. If you die today, where would your soul be? And I've had all kinds of answers. And, and I, I've had people that were Christians. I'd ask, them, I'd ask the question. I'd say, oh, come on, you serve me God? Good, good deal. I said, so you ready to meet the Lord? If you die today, are you ready? And they, they kind of like, well, I think I'm I think I'm, I think I'm going to go there. I think, think about it. But you don't have to think about it. You can know about it. <laughs> you can know for a fact that if I die right now, I'm going to be with the Lord. So I want to pray for you. I want to give you an opportunity. Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're in prison. But I want to give you an opportunity to come to the Lord. Just as you are. No pretenses. You don't got to get yourself ready. Fix yourself up. I got to get myself right. I got to fix my life. And then I'll come to Christ. No, you don't have to do that. He says, come as you are. Come, bring me your broken pieces. Bring me your, your despondentness. Bring me your addictions. Bring me your, your, your crazy attitudes. Bring me all of that. Because I'm the one that can fix it. I'm the one that can fix it. Everybody else is just going to talk about it. But Jesus said, I'm going to be about it. So if that's you today, I want you to just, in your, uh, in, your, in your own way, I want you to just begin to worship the Lord and begin to tell the Lord that you're sorry. <laughs> this is one of the messages that you got to reflect on your life. And maybe there's some, you, you, you may think you're walking right, you may think you're living right, but there's something that you said or did that just wasn't right. Just begin to tell the Lord, I'm sorry. I don't want to end up in that place. I want to spend my eternity with you. Dwelling in the peace of God, in serenity, in constant love. What an environment to be in. Forgive us, God. If we've been comfortable, if we've been complacent in serving you and giving our life to you. Help us, oh God, to be all that you want us to be and to, and, to, and, to, and to experience you the way you want us to experience you. And most importantly, God, as we 
get ourselves in line, as you, as you correct us and get us in line, Lord, help us to reach out to our family members, to our coworkers, to our friends, to those, our neighbors, people that are around us that may be heading down that road, that, that wide road that's leading to destruction. Help us, oh God, to help them. Give us the boldness and the courage to share you with them. In Jesus' name, we love you. We magnify you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for taking on all of the sins, taking on all of the pain, taking on all the sorrows and griefs so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. We give you praise. We magnify you. We lift you up. We honor you. In the name of Jesus. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, I want you to say this prayer with me. There's a story about a young a lady. I'm going to share this with you. There's a story about a lady. She was in church. She went to church. She paid tithes. She prayed. She fasted. She prayed. She did all the things that Christians do. But while she was in church, the Lord allowed her, the Lord gave her an out-of-body experience and took her to hell. And she was like, why did I end up here? She didn't know why she ended up there. The Lord said, because of your unforgiveness. Her unforgiveness was hindering her from being forgiven. And she said when she got there, she felt everything. She said it was just terrible. She said her bones was cracking. It was like, it was terrible. And she still couldn't change. She was trying to figure out why am I here? I serve you, Lord. I go to church. I pay tithes. I pray. I do it. And God said it's unforgiveness. And there's other things that, that were in her heart that she had to release to the Lord. And God allowed her to do that. She, her name is, her last name is Diddle. You want to look her up. She, her last name is Diddle. She gives her testimony. But I said that to say that no matter where you are in your Christian walk, there may be something in you that, that, that God wants to root out, he wants to uproot, he wants to tear down. It may keep you from doing what God really wants you to do. And so today, you can say this prayer, just like everybody else, and know that you're in the hands of God after you say it. So say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Please accept this prayer. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. That you died on the cross to rescue me from sin and death. And to restore me to the Father. I choose now to turn from my sins. My self-centeredness. And every part of my life that does not please you. I choose you. I give myself to you. I receive your forgiveness. And ask you to take your rightful place in my life. As my Savior and Lord. Come reign in my heart. Fill me with your love. And your life. And help me to become a person who is truly loving. A person like you. Restore me, Jesus. Live in me. Love through me. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you said that prayer, you're now a member of the body of Christ. We encourage you to find a good church home. If you don't have a church home, find a place where the, the pastor is living what he's talking about. And he's loving other people. And I want to let you, each and every one of you know that I love you. Love you with the love of Christ. Um, this week's challenge is going to continue from last week. We're going to Work on being prepared for our future and for eternity. We're going to listen to one person about life now and after death. One person. Find one person to share Christ with. Ask them, where are you going to, where are you going to be when you die? Ask them that question. And watch what they answer. And when they do, you with the love of Christ and compassion in your heart. Share Christ with them. Watch what happens. How many lives will you change this week? How many lives will you change this week? How many people will be changed by um, 
by your life? How many people will be changed by your life? Amen. Well, God bless you. May you have a blessed week. May you have the best week of your life. On next week, we're going to be talking about heaven. So <laughs> I want to just leave y'all down there burning. <laughs> but we're going to talk about heaven on next week and the and the expansiveness of it and the and the glory of it and all the things that that is waiting for us as child as, as children of God. We have all of that's going to be just at our at our disposal if we live our life for Christ. So God bless you. Y'all have a wonderful week. And I will see you on Wednesday on our Zoom. If you come in, our, not our Zoom, but we're on Facebook. And we're also live on YouTube. Come and check us out and, uh, and get a good word from the Lord. May God bless you and take care. Until next time.